Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Friday Ramblings. I am your perpetual host, David, and we're going to have a little bit of fun today because we're doing something a little different. We're not going to do a breakdown of a movie series, specifically because of the movie series in question, which you know from the title, Give Me Spoderitos. What we're doing is breaking down how after the first movie and first book, the two series diverged. This is something that's kind of interesting. No, it's not time for Kitty. This is something that's interesting in a lot of ways when it comes to the entertainment world because typically when you get a movie based off a novel, you'll either have a situation where the author will continue to make novel sequels and the movies will be adaptations of those sequels to varying levels of uh, faithfulness or they will make movie sequels even though the author didn't make novel sequels. In this case, we have a third option where they made where the original author wrote sequel novels and Hollywood made sequel movies, but none of them were related to each other. Two paths diverged in the woods. And we're taking both paths today. Because sorry, Robert Frost, I do what I want. I do what I want. So let's break this down real quick. As I said, we're not going to do a breakdown of the movie franchise because Psycho is movies where people get killed and there is crazy person involved. That's really kind of a super detailed breakdown that we are saving for October for Halloween time. So we're going to do... E we're really not going to touch on the plots of the sequel movies, and we're barely going to touch on, touch on the plot of the original, which we're really only going to touch on because it is the only thing that is shared between the two. But, real quick, let's break down Psycho Book 1 and Psycho Film 1. The Psycho novel is a 19... 59 novel written by American writer Robert Block who wrote a ton of stuff besides his uh, this novel and his sequels very prolific author good times and it was adapted extremely quickly by Alfred Hitchcock into a film that came out in 1960 Later to inspire a franchise, including theatrical sequels, television movie spinoff, a multi-season television series. But again, we'll get to that breakdown another month. The novel and the film are very similar. Because the film was an adaptation of the novel. The film is one of the all-time great films ever made, truly. That alone proves Alfred Hitchcock was an incredible director. So, the shared plot is that we have a small motel ran by a gentleman named Norman Bates. Who, apparently, throughout the film, is seen arguing with and being controlled by an overbearing mother. He ends up encountering a woman named Mary Crane, or Marion Crane, in the film. Slight, slight difference in naming there, but, you know, it works. Both of whom stole money from their place of employment. So... Miss Crane ends up at the Bates Motel, accepts the invitation to not just stay at the motel, but have dinner with Norman himself, 
and is subsequently killed while taking a shower. For the film version, the shower scene is, no exaggeration, one of the most iconic scenes in all of Hollywood. The basics of it is, is that it will frighten you and raise the tension greatly, even though you never actually see the violence on screen. The way it is filmed, you see the knife coming down, you see blood mixing with the water coming from the shower head, but you never see the violence on screen. The way Hitchcock films it, I mean, I'm sorry, I've seen the footage, I have seen a lot of modern movies in which murder takes place, whether it be adventure action types or horror suspense movies, and very few death scenes are as powerful as this one, despite the lack of literal on-screen violence. Please look this scene up if you have never seen it. Um, watch it with an open mind. It's an incredibly well-filmed scene. So, things happen. Uh, people come to investigate the disappearance of Miss Crane, Mary or Marianne, depending on which version you're watching. Super Cliff Notes version short, because again, we're not trying to do individual plot breakdowns tonight. It is discovered that Norman Bates, in fact, killed his mother years ago and is suffering from a split personality, or as it is currently called in the uh, psychology field, disassociative identity disorder. We're going with split personality because that is how the condition was referred to at the time that the stories were being made so for the sake of consistency of language we're going to keep going with that for the rest of the review yes i know it's not the currently accepted terminology but we are talking about stuff that is decades old we're, as i said we're trying to be consistent with the language used should you give these novels or these films an opportunity Understand that's what the term's going to be called. Disclaimer over. So, Bates is sent to a mental institution. In the novel, it is said that the mother personality completely takes over Bates' mind. For all intents and purposes, he becomes his mother. However, in a double twist ending, Mother reveals that she had to take over as Norman's personality was actually the murderous psychotic one and that she, in fact, couldn't hurt a fly. In the film, we get the similar ending, but not quite as definitive in that um, it is assumed by the psychiatrist that the police bring in that Mother is the murderous personality, mostly being triggered by Norman being attracted to other women. And while Norman sits in a jail cell, as opposed to the mental institution, uh, Mother protest via voiceover that the murders were no Norman's doing. Hinting at the same ending we got in the novel, but it being a little less definitive. Which, you know, is fine, because it is what it is. We're not going to get into the breakdowns of this too much, because it's kind of a sticky wicket. And that's kind of where things were left for quite a long time. Um, as I said before, we would get a Psycho sequel. Find my notes again, find my notes again. Uh, Psycho 2 would be made in 1983. So 23 years later. This is... Just pew, 
Um, I'm going to get into this more in the breakdown of the film franchise. <laughs> I'm going to make you wait 10 months for it, though. Mm. Do what you got to do. Mm, I don't care. I'm going to make you wait. But, hey, that's the whole thing. They waited 23 years to make a sequel. The novel, interestingly enough, had the same... wait period on it as it came out in 1982. The novel was completed before the screenplay was written for the unrelated Psycho 2 film. According to Robert Block himself, though, Universal Studios loathed the novel, which was written to critique the rise of the Hollywood splatter films in the 20 odd years since the original novel and film were made. Uh, if you want to really get into the history of splatter and the slasher genre and their rise in the 70s, 80s, and, or really the 60s, because I said the movie came out in 1960, um, there's a lot of material written about it. There are books, there are movies. I'm not really going to get into it right now. Honestly, I myself would have to do some more research to get some of my uh, dates and franchises in proper chronological order. But, I mean, that's the thing. Is before Psycho, you know, it, it wasn't really a subgenre where you would have somebody that is definitely not your average person running around killing people. You know, you had monster films in the Golden Age, which we have discussed in previous videos. We, you know, you would have the occasional one-off um, adaptation of like a, a, you know, murder mysteries, which is basically what Psycho is, just with a little bit more of the psychology of the criminal leaning to it. And the, and the plot twist endings. So, you can kind of see where Robert Block is coming from with wanting to make a novel pointing out that with films like his and some of the others that came out in the 60s leading to a genre that was diving to, I mean, just massively. It seemed like every studio was cranking out movies that were all about not just body count, but blood and gore, which, as we pointed out, Hitchcock really didn't show. He would have murders, but he would not have actual on-screen violence. Due to the way he masterfully filmed it, he didn't need it. But again, that's a topic for another time. I might call my partner into that one day. Doing a uh, Generation Expletive conversation, going back and forth about uh, on-screen violence and how over the top it can get, especially within the horror, splatter, slasher genres. It's a very deep subject. It's something we're both going to have to sit down and really ponder. Definitely a thing that's a conversation piece, though. I'll have to propose that to him after I'm done recording this episode, because you folks come first. You do, because I appreciate you listening to me. So as I said, the two films diverge greatly. The Psycho 2 novel discusses the idea that Norman Bates has spent the last two decades locked up in a mental asylum after the events in the first novel. He's had one main psychiatrist spending, has spent that two decades working with Norman himself hoping to become famous due to the infamacy of Norman's murder over the last couple decades and media coverage of it. Long story short, Norman escapes the institution, ends up as a hitchhiker, gets picked up, we jump to... Hollywood, where there is a movie being made based off Norman's life and specifically his murderous crimes. 
it looks like Norman himself has not only managed to get to Hollywood, but is murdering the cast and crew of this film. There is a big swerve ending, though, in which it turns out that the director was the psycho in this case. Um... And that Norman himself was actually, in fact, killed earlier in the novel while hitchhiking. This is certainly saying where I can see where Hollywood would find some issues with this. Besides critiquing the splatter genre and the idea that, you know, you'd have to be kind of crazy yourself to make movies about people this crazy and especially to glamorize them. And I'm not getting into socio-political conversations about that, as we said before. That's something that really should be done as a conversation piece. Um, but, long story short, that combined with the idea that the, that the famous established antagonist himself actually does not appear in the majority of the novel, and that some of the murders attributed to him at first are revealed to be a different person who is stated in the novel to have an eerie resemblance to Norman but that's mostly designed to set up that swerve. This all leads to fun and games. We then get the Psycho House novel which takes place um, 10 years after Norman's death, although the book came out in 1990. So, eh, not a perfect exact year uh, comparison. You know, the books were about eight, nine years apart, but anyway. Plot summary, this is that 10 years after Norman Bates' death, a local entrepreneur has rebuilt the Bates Motel as a tourist attraction and a nice little protagonist named Amy Haynes travels to the infamous Psycho House to write a book about Bates when mysterious murders begin to occur. There would later be a Um, as a little bit of a footnote here, there would later be a book called Psycho Sanitarium written by Chet Williamson that was released just a few years ago in 2016. Um, that is a prequel to Psycho 2 and Psycho House taking place during the time that Norman was in the mental institution as a patient. Um... Its full title is Robert Block's Psycho Sanitarium. So, you know, it, it's we're going to give it honorable mention right here because Block did not write it himself. As he is no longer with us. I believe that's right. It would make a lot of sense. Do, 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 do. Check a few things. Check a few things. Uh, yes. Robert Block sadly passed away on September 23rd in 1994. So, not long after Psycho House came out. Uh, it should be noted, uh, another one of the last books he wrote was called The Jekyll Legacy, which was a collaboration with a gentleman named Andre Norton, and was a sequel to Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, believe uh, yes Robert Block did die of cancer at the age of 77 so yeah all respects to that gentleman but yes that is why the there is a fourth 
semi-official sequel. That's, that's definitely a subject we're going to have to talk some time about. Um, franchises continuing after the original author's death. Some I'm going to have to uh, compile a nice little list for, do some more thinking about. But, we'll all get in our memories. So that's the Psycho Novel series. The Psycho Film series would continue with three direct film sequels, which in which Norman Bates survived. Two and three involve him continuing or returning to the Bates Motel, continuing to murder people, and bringing up some more questions about his family and a family history of mental health issues. Including some lovely events designed to more blatantly trigger and give strength to the mother personality as Norman found himself unable to deal with things that he did not want to know about his life and his family history. Uh, so he's ended with Psycho 4 in which Norman is by and large rehabilitated but having found love and finding out that his lady love is ready to start a family, he calls into a radio talk show to talk with the host about his fears that his family insanity will be passed on to his children, and thus it might be better if he didn't have children, and potentially he himself was no longer part of the living. The majority of this movie due to that lovely frame story of him trying to explain why he's so afraid that his children will be no less uh, mentally healthy than he himself has been for a large part of his life is a series of flashbacks discussing him growing up with his mother and the very codependent oddball relationship they had, including um, heavy implications of some s sexual misconduct from Mother Bates, who was not 100% mentally healthy herself. Now, in between the theatrical movies, we got a television movie that was designed to create a spin-off series that never happened called Bates Motel. That title would later be re refreshed for a TV series that was unrelated. All of this, of course, has been in more recent years, and we have a remake done in 1998 of the original film that was basically a scene for scenery filming. So there was nothing really new done with the storylines. So where does that all leave us? Well, it's the big division between a novelist who had an idea that seemed to hinge more about how basically over time anybody could become psycho. That it's not about, oh, one person who's just destined to be cursed to it. That bad situations especially a series of them, and, you know, bad interactions with other people can drive a variety of people to kill. It's not just Norman alone, or even the Bates family. Just the idea of Norman Bates having existed was enough to drive people that got close to him and his legacy 
to be psycho as well. Interesting thing, if you look at that in the entire franchise of novels that way, or series of novels, depend, again, depending on your terminology you prefer, that, you know, that kind of murderous mental instability is something that is potentially present in everybody. Definitely shows some of the forward thinking that Robert Block had and that he, you know, understood psychology, even if he himself was not a doctor of it. And with the time that passed, especially between the first and the second book, he was keeping track of the new theories and ideas about what makes people murderous. Yeah. Def definitely an intelligent writer underneath it all. Whereas the movies, in that classic style that Block himself was critiquing and calling foul on in his second book, kept with the idea that it was Norman and Norman alone that was the problem. Yeah, he had a messed up life. Yes, he wasn't the only person in his family that was mentally unhealthy, but he was the one that turned murderous. Psycho 4, with the use of his mother as a living entity, thanks to the flashbacks heavy throughout the movie, do paint a much more sympathetic picture of Norman. There was always that sympathetic side of him. You know, he's... He's clearly somebody disturbed. He's, you know, he's, he's got things going on in his head that needs needs to be looked at and, and, you know, he needs help. But, in the films, he was a very much repeat murderer. Thankfully, he did get a happy ending. Plot spoilers, he does survive Psycho 4 and does leave... And does end the movie optimistic about his future with his lady love. So, you know, good on Hollywood for giving the guy a happy ending when it was all said and done. But, that again points out the differences. Block, who seemed to be more concerned with the psychology of becoming psycho and how it can happen to anybody, in a way, paralleling the infamous Killing Joke graphic novel from the Batman franchise and Joker's theory that the only difference between him and the rest of humanity was one bad day. But we will break down Killing Joke another time because that, ooh, that is a big one. That is a big one. But, as I was saying, that tends to be Block's attitude, where Hollywood's attitude is more of individual psychos exist. They are much rarer because they're the ones that keep coming back. As long as, you know. And while they did eventually go for the happy ending, which is rare in the, you know, horror genre, which is fair because honestly, the original psycho especially is more of a appropriately enough psychological thriller and suspense movie, which I'm sorry are not quite the same as horror. They're very similar, but uh, there's some differences, especially in presentation. My little errant hair is fixed here again. So go for that big academic finale. And that's what it's all said and done. That that is the different approaches from the novelists and the Hollywood writers. And it's the main thing where they diverged. Hollywood was not, in the early 80s, going to start calling foul on itself. Especially since that self-same subgenres were still big bank at the time. That would have been an act of self-sabotage. But they couldn't help but want to make a sequel. Especially after that novel came out and reminded people Psycho was a thing. 
Whew. A little sneeze coming on here. Try to subvert it until we're done filming here. Quick wrap up. So is the case of Robert Block, whether consciously or subconsciously, was sabotaging his continued psycho novel series being adapted into film? If he did it consciously, was it because, frankly put, he didn't trust Hollywood anymore now that Hitchcock wasn't around to make these movies to uh, adapt such a story? Or even any variant of a story continuing Norman Bates without reducing the impact of the original and making it more of a standard slasher killer fare? I don't know. Unfortunately, as I said, he is no longer with us and has not been for quite some time. So it's a little hard to ask him. And I'm certainly not condemning Hollywood. The Psycho sequels are very good movies in their own rights. But... As I said, it wasn't a stance Hollywood was ready to take in the 80s, and certainly nobody else was going to adapt it except a major studio. So, wasn't something some indie studio that could have the nerve to make that statement would make? Or some group out in Europe or something? They were doing their own thing in the 80s. They really weren't concerned with Hollywood. They weren't going to pick fights with Hollywood either. It might hurt their international distribution. It's all business after all. But the Psycho novels, even the sequels, did sell well. The films did well. It is one of the great cultural mainstays of the human gone bad kind of storytelling certainly Norman Bates himself is practically cultural slang like, oh yeah dude he's hearing voices hope he doesn't go all Norman Bates and get you in the shower that's a thing so I hope you enjoy me as we take a little bit of a different kind of break now it's really more an of a comparison thing, you know, a rivalry summary, and a classic breakdown. But don't worry, it's still pop culture, it's still entertainment, and that is what the Roulette Productions channel is all about. Subscribe to us, like the video, watch our other videos, like them. We have some wonderful playlists so you, for quicker viewing. We have four incredible shows. They go live every week. We will be here every week. Keep viewing, and we'll keep keeping it positive. Because there's enough negativity on the internet, no reason to shovel on more. Let's be better. Bye-bye.